Today, let us study the Word of God under the sermon titled, The Blessing of Knowing God. Nowadays, when we look around us, we hear the news about all kinds of disasters through the mass media. Along with the coronavirus, many areas are experiencing floods, and there is heavy snowfall in places like Australia. Due to the various disasters throughout the world, all business activities have been halted, and religious gatherings are limited. Everything seems to be restricted because of the current situation. I came to think, the way to pile up blessings in heaven is to do my best while I still have a chance to do something. There are more natural disasters in this age than in any other times. There are cases where luxurious houses that people spend so much time to build were buried overnight by a landslide and some were even swept away by heavy rainfall. Looking at people lose nearly all their possessions, I felt the pain of those who are suffering from these disasters. To save up for a house and enjoy a comfortable life after retirement, people cut back on how much they spend on food and clothing for many years. But in just one morning, their houses were destroyed by a natural disaster. Looking at this tragedy, I could not help but be reminded of God's words, Do not boast about tomorrow. And what belongs to this world is temporary, but what is in heaven is eternal. Because of the pandemic, even family meetings are being restricted, and we cannot meet with our neighbors. Throughout the world, we are experiencing this situation. Since God knows the future of mankind, didn't He create and prepare the glorious kingdom of heaven where there is no more pain, sorrow, mourning, or death? To enter this glorious world, whose guidance must we receive? In this age of the Holy Spirit, we must receive the guidance of the Spirit and the Bride. To be guided by the Spirit and the Bride, we must first know who they are. As God is well aware of the misfortunes that fall upon mankind, He prepared a beautiful world, the Kingdom of Heaven, and paved the way so that we can all go there. God also willingly came to earth in the flesh and is now guiding all our souls to heaven. Sometimes God appeared as a passerby and at other times as an ordinary man. No matter how God appears to us, we the children of Zion should be able to recognize our God. Now, in this age as well, there are people who believe in God and others who do not believe. There are those who heard the message and accepted the teachings and others who did not understand. This is because when God appears to each man, He tests our faith in various ways. As it is written in Isaiah chapter 8, when God appears to many people, He will be a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, He will be a trap and a snare. Many of them will stumble. They will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured. In other words, God is looking for those who would keep their faith to the end, no matter what they see when they look at God who came in the flesh. Considering the way people of the world view God, we wonder, were we not like them when God tested our faith? 
God is almighty and powerful enough to show us tens of thousands of miracles even in this age. Yet God did not choose that path. Rather, God is now quietly guiding us in a humble appearance. While God is in the flesh, God is testing the faith of each individual. 3,500 years ago, the Israelites came out of Egypt and went toward the land of Canaan. When they were in the desert, what did God tell them in Deuteronomy chapter 8? God said that He put the Israelites in that situation in order to test whether or not they believed in God. Sometimes, God humbled them, leading them to a dry land. And sometimes, God brought them to a barren land without any food. At other times, God granted abundant food and allowed water to gush out from a rock. For a period of 40 years, God observed through various circumstances how His children behaved and dealt with their situations. The 40-year journey in the wilderness serves as a shadow of the reality which we are now walking, that is, the desert of faith. In fact, we are now living this kind of life, walking toward heaven. God wants to see how much we know Him and whether or not we would keep our faith regardless of the circumstances. This is what the Bible teaches us. Abraham recognized and received God. Zacchaeus recognized and received God. The centurion recognized and received God. When Mary recognized God and took the alabaster jar of perfume and poured it on Christ's feet, he said that what she had done would be told wherever the gospel would be preached. How blessed were those who recognized God. Through them, God is giving precious lessons to all of us who are living in this age. Let us take a look at 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. It is written, The one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. On the contrary, for those who do not believe, shame, contempt, and everlasting punishment is waiting for them. Verse 7 reads, Now to you who believe, this stone is, what is it to you? It is precious. To you who believe in God, who came in the flesh, He is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, and a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. There is a great difference between those who believe and those who do not believe. Those who believe are the ones who know God. How did Abraham serve God when God appeared to him? How did Zacchaeus treat God? As for the woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, how did she treat God? How did the centurion treat God? How did Mary treat God? There are those who know God and those who do not know God. To those who believe in God, God is their treasure. However, to those who do not believe, God is a stumbling block, a rock that makes them fall, a snare and a trap. Everything about God will become a rock that makes them fall. Let's go to Genesis chapter 18, verse 1. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. God came in the flesh to visit Abraham's household. When he saw them, 
he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me go get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way, now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three seahs of fine flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice, tender calf, and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. In this verse, how did Abraham treat God? Didn't he serve God and receive an extraordinary blessing from him? God blessed him, saying, Your descendants will be as numerous as the stars. He was granted Isaac to continue his bloodline and received much grace and blessings. Abraham knew God and also served him with great reverence. We can confirm this through the Bible. When God came with a mighty appearance, there was no one who doubted who God was. Even in the case of the Israelites, when God spoke with authority, with thunder and lightning, everyone obeyed and followed His command. Trembling with fear, they said to Moses, Do not have God speak to us directly. But please, ask God to choose a prophet to speak to us. This was how the Israelites pleaded with God in the Old Testament times. However, in the New Testament times, God did not teach His Word through the prophets. But He Himself came to the earth in the flesh and taught, This is the way to heaven. Today too, God Himself awakens all the children of Zion through the teachings of the Bible. Even though God came to earth and showed the way to heaven, did everyone who lived at that time regard Him as God? As it is written in 1 Peter chapter 2, Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. There is a clear difference between the two groups. Although God could have come in such a way for people to easily believe in Him, like with thunder from heaven or surfing on a cloud, why didn't He do that? God could have certainly come to earth in a glorious way so that people could have easily recognized Him through His powerful appearance and said, Ah, He is definitely God. However, that is not how He came. Rather, to those who did not believe, He became a stone and a rock that makes them fall. This is why we should always be able to recognize God, no matter how He comes to us. Only who are able to recognize God when He comes? Only God's children are able to recognize God. Only to His children, God granted eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to understand. What about those who are not God's children? Did God allow them to understand the mystery of God? No. God made it so that they could not see with their eyes, hear with their ears, nor understand with their hearts. Those who know God have the right to become His children. God also allowed them to be greatly blessed, like Abraham, Zacchaeus, the centurion, and Mary. We must truly realize how blessed we are to live under God's blessing. 
When God came to this earth, why did He not display the full extent of His glory and splendor, but hide it all behind the tent of the flesh? Although God comes hiding all His glory, what did He say concerning His sheep? They all know Him. Let's see John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 24. The Jews gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep, what do they do? They listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. Because you are not my sheep, you do not believe even though I came to show you the way to heaven. But my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Although God came to earth in human form, the saints of the early church, like apostles John and Peter, accepted, understood, and knew who Jesus Christ was. On the contrary, the Jews, the Pharisees, and the teachers of the law who lived in the same age did not accept Jesus as God. What was the difference between those who believed and those who did not believe? Let's go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 42. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? What did Joseph do for a living? He was a carpenter. Jesus' physical father, Joseph, was a carpenter. They meant, isn't he a carpenter's son? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? He is speaking nonsense. How can he say that? These were the factors that prevented people from believing in God. Now in this age, we need to have faith to be able to receive God even if he comes to earth as the son of a carpenter. Although all the prophecies in the 66 books of the Bible testified about him, they did not believe. Jesus entered Jerusalem riding on a colt. He was born through a virgin and was born in Bethlehem. Numerous prophecies testify about Jesus Christ. However, they did not receive him, insisting, his father is a poor carpenter. How can a carpenter's son claim that he came down from heaven? This is how they rejected Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. The same situation is repeating itself in this age. It is for these very same reasons that they are not able to know or receive God who came to the earth. Let's go to Matthew, chapter 27, verse 50. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. This is the scene of Jesus' death when he was crucified on the cross. He was God who came to earth to save mankind, but he was crucified. It is something difficult to understand. If people mocked and ridiculed them like this, well, wasn't your God crucified and put to death? How many of them will be able to hold on to their faith? Although he was a son of a carpenter and was crucified for the sin of mankind, in reality, who is he? He is our God. This is the kind of faith that we should have. When we understand the situation of Jesus' first coming, we can clearly understand what will happen at His second coming. 
Jesus said, My sheep know me and will follow me. He also said that for those who do not believe, the Savior is a stone that causes them to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. As for the people who correctly recognize God, God blesses them just like the twelve disciples. You will eat and drink at my table in the kingdom of heaven. You will rule over the twelve tribes of Israel. You will reign as the royal priesthood in heaven. You will be guided to the world of peace, glory, and eternal joy, where there is no more pain, sorrow, mourning, or death. God did not grant these blessings to just anyone. Among 600,000 Israelites, 20 years old or more, who came out from Egypt, only two men safely entered the land of Canaan. Everyone else was ensnared by various circumstances on the way. Nowadays, when we look at God's physical appearance, some see the appearance of a carpenter, and others perceive him as God even though he did carpentry work. Although he was put to death on the cross by his own creation, some still viewed him as God, but others regarded him as a feeble man who could not overcome the powers of this world. However, we came to realize that Christ lived such a life to fulfill all the prophecies and make atonement for our sins. God came as the son of a carpenter. He was crucified, branded as a heretic, unacknowledged by people, and uneducated. His family did not believe in him, considering him to be out of his mind and tried to take hold of him. Furthermore, people continuously persecuted those who actually did believe in him. Yet despite all this, who was he? He was our God. Nevertheless, whenever people saw Jesus, they thought, if he is God, why is he persecuted so severely? If he is God, why doesn't his own family believe in him? If he is God, how can his own family think he is out of his mind? Wasn't he a powerless man who was simply crucified by the people of the world? Our God is Almighty, who created the heavens and the earth. And He is able to perform all kinds of wonders and miracles. However, when people looked at the work He was carrying out in the flesh, He looked so poor and shabby in their eyes. So they wondered, is He truly God Almighty? These were the circumstances that covered people's eyes from recognizing God during the days of the early church. In the same exact way, slanderers are trying to hinder us in this age as well. It is written, To you who believe, God is precious. But to those who do not believe, a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Let's see another verse in Isaiah chapter 8. Verse 13. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. And He will be a sanctuary. But for both houses of Israel, what will He be? He will be a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, what will He be? He will be a trap and a snare. If God appears before us with magnificent glory, who would dare to speak against Him? Would anyone crucify Him on the cross or hurl insults at Him, branding Him as a heretic? Who would dare to spit on Him or punch Him? How can anyone dare to commit such a wicked act of trying to stone Him? This is how much they did not believe in Him. God hid everything that could reveal His true identity. 
in Isaiah chapter 8, what will Christ be? To those who do not believe, Christ will be a testing stone, a stone that causes people to stumble, a trap and a snare. Our gospel is led by our father and mother. Until now, some might have come to our church influenced by others, thinking, many people stream there, should I join them as well? But from now on, what will God separate from the wheat? He will separate the weeds from the wheat. In Matthew chapter 13, what will God do with the bad fish and the good fish? God will separate the two and throw out the bad ones. During this process, God will show people things that make it difficult for them to believe. Christ appeared to be weak and feeble when he was captured by the Roman soldiers. When Peter drew his sword to protect Jesus, the other disciples ran away in great fear. These are the kinds of situations that took place to make it difficult for people to believe. In these same situations, what about God's children? What will they say? Although he was a carpenter's son, he is our God. Although he was crucified, he is our God. Although he was branded as a heretic, he is our God. Although he was not acknowledged by the people, he is our God. Although he was uneducated, he is our God. Although he had a physical family, he is our God. Although he was persecuted, he is our God. Although his own family thought he was out of his mind, he is our God. Then, why does the Bible record what happened at Christ's first coming? We ought to think about this carefully. God sees the end from the beginning. Do you think that God would have put any word or teaching that is unnecessary for his children's salvation in the Bible? Abraham was blessed by receiving God. Peter was blessed by receiving God. Zacchaeus was blessed by receiving God. The woman who was subject to bleeding was blessed by receiving God. The centurion was blessed by receiving God. They all received God and were blessed. Their viewpoint was different from that of the world. When people looked at Christ, he looked ordinary. How can this man be God? Is this carpenter really God? He was not educated. But from where did he get his knowledge? Simply put, they mocked and ridiculed him. They looked down on Jesus, regarding him as someone weak and powerless. Nevertheless, what did John say? He is God, who is the Word from the beginning. He became flesh and dwelt among us. This man is Christ Jesus. What did Peter say? You are the Christ the Son of the living God. What about Apostle Paul? He is in very nature God. He is the Almighty God. Although Jesus displayed various physical aspects about himself while he was on earth, the disciples and the faithful people in the early church recognized and believed that Jesus Christ was God himself. He was taken away helplessly and seemed powerless. Despite that, the saints of the early church said, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Through the history of the early church, we can see the type of understanding and realizations they had about Christ. In this age, we, God's sheep, must understand God's voice correctly and receive the inheritance of the eternal kingdom of heaven that God has prepared for us. The more members come and the more the gospel is preached to the nations, the more various situations may arise. 
no matter what, our father and mother have come to this earth. Father is our eternal father, and mother is our eternal mother. No matter how much the people of the world slander us, it does not change the fact that our Heavenly Father and Mother are the ones who gave birth to our souls and are raising us now. Let's go to Matthew chapter 11, verse 2. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who was to come? Or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. No matter how I look or what kind of surroundings I appear in, who do you say I am? There are those who saw him as God Almighty. When people slandered Jesus, even in the slightest way, John and James said, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? This was how much they revered Jesus and regarded him as precious. It was the same with Peter and Paul. That was the way of faith that all the prophets of the gospel who led the early church walked. No matter how much the Jews slandered Jesus, saying, Isn't he a carpenter's son? If you are the Christ, why don't you come down from the cross? Despite their insults and slander, Christ was silent. It is written that he did not open his mouth as a sheep before her shears is silent. Was it because he had no power or authority? Not at all. Didn't he walk the path of prophecy only for our salvation? It was all because of our sins and iniquities. As God came to earth in the flesh to carry our sins, we should correctly know and receive God while God is still with us on earth. We should regard God as precious while God is near us. While we still have time to serve God who dwells with us, let us revere our God. Like Zacchaeus, Mary, Peter, John, and James, hoping that all of us will bring more glory and honor to our God. I would like to conclude today's sermon. Thank you very much.